So thanks very much. Um, I'm going to switch gears from where Catherine was talking about the new legal infrastructure that's going to be governing UK trade with Europe. I'm going to be talking a little bit about what's happened in the recent past and the role of the US dollar and the British pound sterling in UK trade in general. And what we can learn about the use of currency in global trade from studying the specific example of the United Kingdom. And so um, I'll just uh, begin by saying the what I'll be showing you comes from a, analyses of confidential administrative microdata from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and they don't endorse any of our findings. Um, these are two papers I'm going to be talking about today. The first is written uh, with Professor Giancarlo Corsetti here at Cambridge, as well as one of our former PhD students, Dr. Lou Hahn. And the second one um, is also written with Dr. Lou Hahn, our former PhD student, and one of our current PhD students, Mr. Min Kyu Son. I'm sorry. So just to set the background of the questions we'll be asking, it's a widely understood observation that the vast majority of international trade conducted globally is conducted in only a small handful of currencies, such as the US dollar, the British pound sterling, the euro, the Swiss franc. In an important and influential paper in 2015, the current chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, Gita Gopinath, emphasized that the dominant role that the US dollar plays in global trade is one of the key factors driving the asymmetric transmission of economic shocks across countries. And to flesh out her example in some detail, Gopinath observed that virtually all US imports are invoiced in US dollars. And in practice, what this means is when the US dollar moves in value against another currency, such as the yen or the sterling, there's essentially no change in the US import price of the good coming in. And there's essentially almost no impact on US inflation. It's very, very muted. In contrast, if we take almost any other country around the world. So for example, she looks to Turkey. We see that Turkey invoices 60% of its goods in US dollars on the import side, but it only imports 6% of its merchandise from the United States. When the Turkish lira depreciates 10% against the US dollar, this weakening of the lira results in a rise in import prices in lira terms of a full 10% over two years. So what this means is that a movement in the Turkish lira rate of uh, the dollar lira rate for Turkey, the full brunt of the shock is felt by Turkey. So overall, what we understand is that there are a variety of benefits for an economy of having a dominant currency. So the example I just gave you is that it provides some insulation against real international economic shocks. So what we do in these two studies is we're gonna analyze individual export transactions from British firms around the time of the Brexit referendum vote in June, 2016, at which point we had a massive depreciation of the British pound sterling against all major currencies. We're gonna use this as sort of experimental setup to better understand the functioning and the evolution of what Gopinath refers to as the international price system that governs global trade. Now, why should we study Britain in particular? Well, two big reasons. First of all, currency is a very active margin of choice for UK exporters. 99% of British export value from uh, going outside the European Union, we don't know much about the currency of trade for British trade with the European Union, but 99% of export value outside the European Union originates from firms that invoice in at least two distinct currencies. We also know the British firms switch their invoicing currency over time to a particular country for a particular product. This is sort of very active margin. The second thing that we observe about Britain is that the US dollar's importance in British exports has been rising over the last 10 years. So from 2010 to 2019, UK export value that was invoiced in US dollars rose by 50%. Over the same period, the share of import value invoiced in US dollars increased only 5%. And importantly, this transition away from sterling and into US dollars preceded the Brexit referendum vote. So if we just count 
British export transactions outside the EU, we see that the share of transactions that were invoiced in dollars were rising quite dramatically, 18% over this five-year period before Brexit. So this leads us to sort of two research questions I'll discuss. The first, um, you might say to yourself, well, should the currency of invoicing even matter? As economists, we tend to think that prices through arbitrage should equilibrate. So how can it be that we could have persistent differences in prices of goods coming from the UK going to a destination? The second question we want to ask is, well, what are the factors behind the increasing use of US dollars by British exporters? And so to get at this first question, we're going to very precisely ask ourselves, are the different invoicing currencies used by British exporters correlated with different levels of exchange rate pass through into import prices at the level of individual transactions? If yes, over what time horizon? And to do this, we're going to look at the three-year period around the Brexit referendum vote. The second question we're going to look at by very specifically, we're going to be focusing in on British exporters and we're going to look at which currency they choose when they're entering a new foreign market that they haven't sold into before. So for this first question, the way we're going to tackle this, we're going to get um, HMRC's universe of export transactions going outside the EU from 2015 to 2017. We're going to classify every single transaction according to whether it was invoiced in sterling, in US dollars, or the local currency in that foreign market, such as the Japanese yen, the Canadian dollar. We're then going to apply an econometric technique. We're going to get a control for the price level of charge by a firm for its each individual product. And this is going to allow us to extract the average weekly price of exports when we denominate them in sterling. So I'll say that just again. So we're going to take uh, all of the data, we'll split it into three different bins, and for each of these bins, we're going to apply an econometric method that will allow us to extract the average weekly price of the goods in that bin. And so here I'm going to turn to the actual results. So in the graph in front of you, the x-axis represents weekly time with minus 72 corresponding to the first week of January in 2015, zero corresponding to the third week of June in 2016. This was the week of the Brexit referendum vote. And 78 corresponding to the last week of December to 2017. The red line is going to represent the value of the exchange rate measured in units of sterling per foreign currency. And the blue line is going to be the average weekly price of a good invoiced in pound sterling. Now, for both the exchange rate and the price, we're going to set them equal to zero or normalize them to have a, a value of one in the third week of June 2016. That corresponds to on the y-axis zero. And then the other points in the y-axis are going to measure percent deviations from that value in the third week of June 2016. And so what you see here, there's a dramatic and sharp increase in the red line. This is the roughly 10% depreciation of the pound sterling against other major currencies. The blue line is showing you what's happening to prices of goods that were invoiced in sterling. The first observation for an economist is that early on, the prices of sterling invoiced exports really didn't move much at all. It was quite a slow adjustment. And it's only gradually after a full 18 months that we see the price of goods invoiced in sterling catching up to the weaker value of the pound. Now we can then switch gears and look at what happened to goods that were invoiced in the local currency of a foreign destination. And here what we see is something quite different. When in the third week of June 2016, we have a dramatic 10% depreciation of the pound sterling, we almost immediately see a rise in sterling terms of the export goods that were denominated or invoiced in um, the local currency of the foreign destination. So in practice, what this means is that the British exporter that was invoicing in say Japanese yen had a big increase in their markup, their profit per unit when measured in sterling terms. The Japanese consumer saw no change in the price in these first early weeks um, after the Brexit referendum vote. Now, over time, 
the sterling price of goods that were invoiced in local currency actually exceeded the appreciation of foreign currencies. So by the time, in general, by the time we get to the end of the period at 18 months, the sterling price is roughly in line with the value of the sterling. But the, the notable interesting thing here is that for the Japanese consumer, over this 18 months, when the pound has been declining in value, the price of a good that they are buying measured in yen is actually gone up a bit. Now, the third group of um, goods we can look at are those that were invoiced in US dollars. This, for this graph, we've excluded all transactions to the United States because we're trying to understand precisely what does it mean for third country um, transactions invoiced in dollars. But so what we see here is a picture that looks much more like the local currency invoice transactions rather than the sterling invoice transactions. There's a very quick adjustment of prices in sterling terms and goods invoiced in dollars very closely track and value the movements of the US dollar to uh, the British pound sterling. So what are the big picture takeaways from this? Well, the first key thing is that there are very large differences in exchange rate pass-through between pound invoiced transactions on the one hand and dollar and local currency invoiced transactions on the other couple of big things, um, over 18 months, the differences in the different currency schemes basically narrowed. And so at the end of the period, all of them tended to align with the weaker pound. And what this means is that after 18 months, there was no improvement in British price competitiveness in foreign markets. So there's no persistent benefit of this large depreciation for British exporters in the price side. The other important thing is that as we see all of these prices drifting up over time to come in line with the weaker pound, we believe this corresponds to um, an increase in the cost of imported inputs. So we know that um, from our own estimation, once we hit about 36 weeks after the referendum, the sterling price of imports had fully adjusted to the weaker pound. So it became more expensive for British uh, producers to use foreign sourced parts. Now, one of the interesting features here is that the increase of the sterling in the sterling export price of local currency invoice transactions, as I said earlier, it exceeded the appreciation of foreign currencies. And this, we believe, reflects two things, an increase in the cost of imported inputs, and also a type of pricing strategy known as pricing to market. The British firms that use local currency are setting their price to get a sort of constant markup or profit per unit on every good sold in a foreign market. And they're setting the price very specifically to the demand conditions in the individual destinations and using local currency to do what we call price discriminate across different foreign countries. Now, the next question I'm going to turn to is I've just in some ways explained to you that when we see British exporters using local currency, they're able to extract a sort of profit per unit or a higher markup than when they use other currencies. And so then this sort of raises the question, well, if pricing to market and using local currency is so great, what factors are there that are inducing a British firm to choose to invoice its exports in US dollars as more of them are doing over time? So in the economics literature, we have three um, well understood and prominent explanations. One we call strategic complementarity. And this is the idea that an exporter is going to invoice its sales in a foreign destination in the same currency as that used by the majority of its competitors in that foreign destination. And they do this so that they can maintain stability of their price relative to their competitors in the case of exchange rate fluctuations. So you want to sort of maintain a stable market share. You do this by maintaining a stable price. The second is a risk hedging um, practice. So for an exporter that imports a lot of its parts in a particular currency, say dollars, those exporters are more likely to invoice their output or exports also in dollars. And so by invoicing both the import side and the export side in the same currency, they can um, mitigate risk of fluctuations. The third explanation that we introduce in this paper is we see that there's a fixed cost to managing a currency. And what we observe with British firms in particular 
is that experience with using dollars in one foreign destination market in the past seems to lower the cost of using dollars in new foreign markets. And this leads to sort of positive feedback loop where firms are more likely to use dollars for the first two reasons. And then as they gain experience, they're more likely to use, introduce the use of dollars into other foreign markets. All of these forces together contribute to the rise and sustenance of the dollar as a dominant currency. And so empirically what we do in this graph, we have an econometric model where we first control for strategic complementarities. And we find that the probability of using the dollar in a firm's new foreign markets is correlated with the share of its competitors that are also using dollars. We also find that firms are more likely to use dollars in a new foreign market when their imported inputs are invoiced in dollars. But the third thing that we showed sort of different and new is that if a firm has been using dollars for longer in its existing foreign markets, the probability of using dollars in a new market rises and it rises with each individual year. A further refinement on that picture I've just shown you is that you might be aware of the fact that exporting firms that are larger and that have longer tenure tend to do more sophisticated things. They export more products, they use more currencies. So in this graph, what we've done is we've controlled for a firm's duration of export experience. And so if you focus in on the red line in the middle of this graph, those four dots represent firms that have four years of experience exporting outside the European Union. Okay, so to foreign markets for the UK. Those firms that not only have been exporting for four years, but have also been using dollars for four years have the highest probability of using dollars when they enter a new market. So the fact that they um, have used dollars for four years implies that in addition to the other factors, the probability of using dollars in a new market is going to be about 12% higher than otherwise. For a firm with four years of export experience that only has one year of dollar invoicing experience, the additional likelihood that it will use the dollar in a new foreign market is only about 2%. So there's sort of this learning dynamic we think we're capturing. Now, to wrap up um, what I've kind of gone through very quickly today, is that our studies of export pricing by British firms around the time of this interesting Brexit referendum and large depreciation have given us new insight into how firms price in international markets. And specifically, one of the things we've learned is that firms use different invoicing currencies to implement specific pricing strategies. And notably, when firms want to set different prices across different foreign markets and price discriminate, and they want to maintain particular market per unit, they do so through the strategy of invoicing in the local currency of a destination. That said, we still observe this rising share of US dollars by British firms. Many factors are influencing this. Importantly, what are your competitors doing? What is the currency used for your inputs? But also that your own experience in using dollars makes you more likely to use them in the future in other markets. And this is sort of a positive feedback mechanism that seems to contribute not only to what's changing in the United Kingdom, but also as a contributing factor to the dollar's dominance and sustained dominance in global trade. So I'll stop there. <laughs>